it isn't that the, the people on social media are such good at persuasion. They're not, but they're, but you're being bombarded by it so much. And there's so much volume, right? And the doom scrolling and, and spend, wasting two hours, swipe, 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 swipe. It has its effect. It does. And so that's the issue. It's, it's a lot of very bad chemistry. In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, coming back with a it's going to be a fantastic guest. It's going to be a fantastic conversation. Have you ever wondered how certain people in industry, whether it's, it can even be politics or even, you know, certain specific people in like leading their families or anything, have the ability to lead in a certain way that gets results. It's really an amazing thing. And today we're going to have a discussion about persuasion. And that would be my argument as to why uh, certain people have the ability to persuade families, industry, even in potential politics. We're going to have a discussion about that today with Carlos Branga. So Carlos is an independent communications researcher. He's a writer. He's a coach. He's the author of The Rules of Persuasion. Carlos is currently a PhD student in communications and rhetoric at the University of Maryland. He holds a BA in humanities and classical Greek from Hampton's Sydney College and completed the post-baccalaureate program in classics at the University of Pennsylvania. He currently resides in Bethesda, Maryland with his wife and two kids. And as I expressed there at the very beginning, I'm super excited about this conversation. I am passionate about learning better ways, you know, improving my skill set of persuasion. I've led teams of people in my corporate world. Obviously, I'm trying to lead my family, trying to increase my ability to persuade more effectively. And it's a skill that can be sharpened. It can be improved which is why I'm super excited about this conversation, Carlos. So welcome to the show. Randy, thank you for being on. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you to anyone who's listening out there as well. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So take a few minutes. I kind of went over the, the 30,000 foot view, a lot of the bullet point things, but tell everybody a little bit more about you. Go a little bit more in detail. Tell you a little bit about your story, kind of where the idea and your passion for persuasion came from. And uh, yeah, let's dive in. Yeah, so real quickly, I, I came to the U.S. when I was young. I'm from El Salvador originally. I grew up in, in New York City, the, the South Bronx, actually, back in some of the old New York. And went to school here. When when my education was complete, I went back to El Salvador, and I worked as a journalist for three years, covering the post-war period. A friend of mine had become a consultant at the time, and her boss wanted to publish a book, but he wanted he didn't want to write it. So... I got a call asking if I wanted to do a contract to, to ghost write this book. And so I did. And when the project was over, he said, listen, would you like a job in consulting? I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't a business person at all. I was a classics major, a Greek major. So, but it was, it paid well, <laughs> which was nice. And I thought, well, I'll take it for a year until I figure out what's next. And one year became 20. I ended up staying, uh, becoming a partner at, at Accenture and then at UI. Left consulting a few years ago. I joined a really interesting company called World 50 which is a, a private CXO uh, 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 kind of club in a way. So you've got 50 CFOs, 50 CHROs. It's people, you know, people like Apple and Microsoft and right and Boeing. And, and uh, I was uh, helping the members do research and innovate. And then I left 450, decided that it was time to go back to my first calling and I was writing and I became an independent researcher and writer. And this book came about in an interesting way because it wasn't the book that I set up to write. I sat down to write a novel, which will come out later this year. But writing can be a lonely thing. So I, I wanted some social contact. So I decided to volunteer with nonprofits. And I joined a website called Catchify, where they match you with projects. And my very first person I got matched was about, the project was about communication. He very senior person who leads a really remarkable uh, international relief agency. And his project was help. I'm having a hard time communicating. I'm having a hard time sticking to, sticking to a script and I'm not very effective in delivering a message. So when I talked to him, I said, Hey, there, there are two issues here. One is when I was at world 50, I got to see a lot of famous speakers at the Hillary Clinton sort of level. Right. And I said, the, they tend to come in one or two flavors. You kind of get the classical musicians who can read a prompter or a speech. 
note for note perfectly. Then there are the jazz musicians, the people who kind of improvise. It's the same message, but it's never quite the same delivery each time, right? And I said, you're definitely a jazz musician. And you, so we should stop worrying about Bach for a second. But I said, more importantly, though, is this, that I've read your speeches, I've seen your videos, and I'm not sure what you're trying to convince me of. Uh, it's not coming across clearly. So why don't we focus on this? And I ordered some books, which were supposed to be a persuasion, but they really weren't. I found that they were about influence or about negotiation or about arguing or closing a deal. And, and I didn't want that. I wanted a book on persuasion and I couldn't find one. So I went back to a book I'd read in college called The Rhetoric by the philosopher Aristotle. And I turned it into a PowerPoint. I turned one part of it into a PowerPoint deck. And I said to this uh, gentleman, let's work through the stack over the next two months. I think it'll solve the problem. And we did, and it did. It was a very successful project. He invited me to a second project. I did that with him. A year later, I had done a dozen of these projects with founders and CEOs of nonprofits. And, and my wife said, hey, you should really write this down. So I said, no, it's, it's too personal. It's one-on-one. -on -one. She goes, no, just put together an outline. So I did. I sent it to the agent or a friend of mine, and the agent said, hey, if, if you write the book, I'll sell it. So just start writing. Uh, took me a year to research, another year to write it, and then a year to publish it because publishing is a slow game. And the book came out last fall, and that's the book that I'm here to talk about today. It's called The Rules of Persuasion. Right? And the subtitle is, uh, if I remember correctly, How the World's Greatest Communicates. Uh, sorry, I'm going to put it right here. How the World's Greatest Communicators Convince, Inspire, Lead, and Sometimes Deceive. Which just that subtitle alone, that's... That's engaging, right? That's that's interesting. Very good. So why don't you take a second and just like, so if folks aren't familiar with the word persuasion or even pay attention or even notice like what is going on, can you give us a little bit of a, uh, just an overview or even a definition of what pers persuasion is? Sure. I, I can summarize the, 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 the ideas in the book maybe in a couple of ways. One is whenever I coach anyone, I, I start with the question, persuasion is dot, 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 finish the sentence. And I've never had anyone who could, who could finish it with confidence. They have an answer, but they're not sure if it's right. And I say, this is important because it's hard to be good at something that you can't define, right? And I understand when you can't define it, but that's part of the issue. So let's come up with definition and let's use Aristotle's, which is that persuasion is a demonstration that something is true or seems to be true. Full stop. That's it. It's simple, but it's very powerful. It has many implications. And he adds to that, and by the way, only three things persuade. The character of the communicator, whether it's a person, a school, a government, right, political party, candidate, whatever it happens to be. Uh, the arguments presented, things like facts and figures and evidence and proofs. And then the emotion felt by the audience as the, as the communicator speaks. That's it. Now, the, you've heard this called ethos, pathos, logos probably many, many times, but you probably didn't hear very much more than that because there's a weird thing about Aristotle, which is that the more obvious something is, the less he explains it. And this was so obvious, that he doesn't really explain it. And also because his book wasn't meant to be a book. It, it was, as best as we know, teaching notes. He, was, he ran the Lyceum. And so he, we think it was his private, just class notes. So it doesn't follow a, a, a set sort of treaties. It goes from beginning to end, which, which is why you've only heard that and not much else. So I wanted to answer two questions. I wanted to answer, well, what do you mean by that? First of all, Aristotle, what you, when you say character, what is that? And then also, how does persuasion actually work? What is really going on when we use this term? So uh, what I say in the book is that if we think about the character of, of a communicator, we can divide it into seven pieces, things like, origin or style, language, associations, categories, etc. When we think about the arguments, there are seven kinds. There's logic, there's proofs, there's witnesses, uh, there's laws and antecedents. So there, you have seven components. And then when you think about emotion, there are seven emotions, types of emotions, it's positive, negative, mystical, religious, exhortative, con you know, contemplative, inspirational. And that's why when I did this, I had 21 things, right? Like, there's, okay, there's like 21 building blocks, but I wanted a metaphor that wasn't building blocks <laughs> to put it all together. And then it occurred to me uh, that it's high school chemistry. And I thought it's like a periodic table 
really the way it works is that we we pick and choose from these elements and we build messages right and um, and i say that i've looked at thousands of messages and i say it's people to people people to gods gods to gods and gods to people and every message i've ever seen across time place culture right epic era is some combination of these 21 things so which means then that persuasion is chemistry with language as i describe it in the book and so through a discussion that we had earlier this uh, last week, and then obviously doing a little bit of research on you, you talk about how bringing in elements of that chemistry into a speech or into a leadership role and how important that is to persuade and to encourage leaders to, for the followers and that type of thing. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that chemistry piece and how certain, depends on the situation, might require X amount of elements, right? Versus at other times, it might require different ones. Can you just elaborate a little bit more about the, yeah, the chemistry piece? Sure, right, because it's like, you know, it's like like real chemistry, right? I want to make something. Now, I don't know of anything that's made that has all the elements in it, <laughs> in the universe, at least in our world. So likewise, in persuasion, we don't use all the elements. And I always joke that there's, even in real chemistry, there's a whole class of just, for just one element, carbon, it's called organic chemistry. <laughs> so it's a year long course that just about one thing. And I think the same thing holds here. There are certain elements that are really powerful, like for example, origin, where you come from, maybe it's the most important thing in character. And so um, the what happens is that the communicator says, okay, I'm, I'm going to use these things and to make the most effective message. And, and, and the whole idea is that I want you to believe something, right? Now, what I find when I coach people is really interesting is that almost to a person, I've done probably 40 different coaching projects. And, and, and now with, corporate as well, nonprofit. What I find is that almost every time what's going on is the persuasion can be thought of as a ship with three masts, right? And only the argument sail is open. <laughs> the character sail is tightly wound up and closed, and so is emotion. The poor argument sail is doing all the work, which is I mean it's kind of tattered, has some holes in it, right? But and it's carrying, trying to push everything along. So I tell people, let's open the character sail, let's open the emotion, let's lower the argument. And watch how fast and far you can go, right? By just rearranging that. So almost always it's small changes. It's little things that we change in the formula and suddenly everything works. Again, like real chemistry where you have, it's, it's, it's almost right. And the chemist finally gets just the right amount of something and then everything is perfect. The same thing happens with, with this. So the process, is it a an extensive process? Is it one of those things that you're now trained through your experiences, right? And through coaching other people, can you hear a message and almost decode it almost like in real time? Or is it something that you have to really sit with, contemplate, and then really kind of just piece it out, map it out? I'm just curious on, on the process. Some messages are more complex. For the most part, once you understand this, you see it immediately. And I've gotten to the point where I, I can't look at anything, you know, or read anything, or whether it's a commercial or whether it's a symphony or even a painting, and the first thing that the mind is like, okay, I can see the chemistry of what this person was doing. And and I and it's fun to me to say, is this good, is it bad? And in fact, when I coach people, I will show a formula, right? And then we watch a movie clip. And I say, watch the elements at work, and then they can see it. And, it, and we get to the point where I can give you a formula, and I'll ask you, just invent something that uses this formula. And people can, because they learn how, right? So take an element like origin so origin is is where character comes from right and so this is a very important thing and it's a there's a strange power right uh and i i, I, kill, I tell the story for example if you and i were at the airport and our flight were delayed and we're just standing there looking at the flight board we don't know each other you could be from anywhere in the world theoretically almost at that point right but I start to talk, suddenly it turns out that you're not from anywhere. We are from the same side of the world and the same side of the same side of the world. And we call that US. And then it turns out you're from the same state and not only from the same state, but the same county and the same city and the same neighborhood and the same street and the same numbers in the street. The, the world shrinks, right? The more it shrinks, the more I want to believe you. To the point that it finds out that you grew up across the street from me and we just didn't know each other, but I knew your cousin 
at that point, there's nothing, almost nothing you can tell me that I'm not, I don't want to believe. And it's this weird phenomenon that probably goes back to like our old right evolution where the fact that we were from the same group was a matter of life and death. There's a vestige of that, that we, we want to believe. And it's a funny thing. We want to believe people who share our origin. And that's why people will ask you, where'd you go to school? Right? What did you train? Who trained you? Especially in elite or tribal groups, origin has a huge, huge impact on whether you're going to be believed or not. And so um, if you say, okay, that's an element, it's a very powerful one. What part of your origin would make me believe you? And if I can find it and now use it, I've just opened the sale, right? For the first time. And so we, what I find often is just that it's not even that hard to find. It's just that it hasn't been looked at at all. So once you look and you see it, you go, oh, okay, I get it. Let me use that, right? On the other side, emotion, I will often ask people, I always ask people, okay, when you stop speaking or as you're speaking, and certainly when you stop, what do you want me to feel? Right? What emotion do you want me to feel? And it's amazing how people who are otherwise extremely accomplished can't answer that question because they haven't thought about it. So I say, if you haven't thought about it, that's a problem because they're going to feel something. And if you're not in control, then I don't know who is. So let's design that. Just those two changes. Find something about you that makes you believable in who you are. And then think about what you want people to feel when you stop talking is a radical change and it's its effect is immediate immediate and people come back and they're shocked at the effect that it had and i say this is the chemistry all you did was use the elements and suddenly the power has gone through the roof and it was there all along you just didn't know so it becomes an awareness of the individual being presented to or spoken to of these elements like you said that were not necessarily in in the open to be able to have that person be attracted to that other individual. So the, so the ideas or the thoughts that are going through my mind right now is it, it's simply, it simply probably isn't the right word, but it, it almost is in the idea of storytelling, meaning the ability to per- persuade in my mind, right, is the ability to craft and take words. I have friends of mine that have the ability to craft a message in a, in a story with words and emotions and, and all of that. It's an amazing thing to watch from the audience. Is that how much of storytelling comes along with that persuasion piece? Storytelling is a delivery mechanism in my mind, right? So again, we use chemistry as that metaphor. I make medicine. There are medicines that you can take as a powder. You can take it as a pill. You can take it as an injection. You can take it, right, as a cup. Stories are like cups. We like to just drink a little bit of something, right? It's probably the easiest medicine to take. We're kind of happy because you never go to the doctor and it's like, oh, no, no, just drink this little cup and it's over. That's happy. That's a story, right? And it's narrative, right? Technically speaking. And narrative in my mind as a writer, I think of it as change over time. That's it. What changes over what period of time? That's the foundation to me of narrative. And so uh, the people who are good storytellers, they just have, they have an ability to take the chemistry and deliver it to you. But other people are, do it differently, right? I'm a student of a guy named Edward Tufte, who was the guru of information design. And his books teach you how to, how to persuade with a picture, right? With a graph, visually. So there's a, there are people who are very good at persuading you. And I talk about, for example, Magritte, the painter, and his painting, uh, Treasury of Images, is, is visual persuasion. Other people use other things. So I think it's uh, you. It helps if you say I've developed a, a talent for one of these delivery mechanisms, but it's just a delivery mechanism. It does nothing inherently. That this is the right way to do it. Uh, it's just human nature that of the. It's there. It's much more common to find a good storyteller than a good painter, <laughs> right? Or a good visual persuader. There are more verbal persuaders than there are visual persuaders, but they all they can all work you know, fine in the right hands. Of course. So then the other thought then that's coming to my mind is that persuasion can be used as a negative, as a negative tool versus a positive tool and how much of an impact that can have on a family, on a community, on a society. Talk a little bit about that. How, if you're not 
noticing it or paying attention to it if it's it's being used in in ways that isn't necessarily a good thing and how important that is to to uh, comprehend and understand what's going on yeah this is this is a exceedingly important point and there's a whole chapter in my book on the corruption of persuasion and because it is chemistry chemistry is amoral right randy i can save your life with chemistry i can take it with chemistry i can it goes in whatever direction the chemist takes it and so language is the same way and and what i did in that chapter is there was a there is a book called the language of the third Reich by a gentleman named victor klemper who who was the linguist who survived uh nazi germany and he wrote a book where he examines language uh and what i say in the my book is if we look at certain ph- phenomenon that he describes and we label it which is what i do and i deal with nine things what they are are markers of the chemistry, right? And I pick these nine, I say, because all nine are present in American contemporary social and political discourse, which to me argues that someone is trying to poison us. So uh, I think sometimes with my book is, is in a way, a kind of vaccine, right? As, as a way of getting you or helping a reader understand what am I hearing? What am I seeing? And hopefully uh, it has the other advantage of making you a very good critic, I believe of what you're seeing. And, and, and when you can see the chemistry and you can recognize it, you're operating at a much higher level than just receiving the message. So it has an, a, you know, an ancillary benefit of learning how to persuade is that you also learn when others are trying to persuade you and, and understanding what the formula is very, very quickly. In fact, I was on a call recently where somebody wanted to offer me some kind of like influencer thing, right? And it, it Within a minute, I, I realized this is where it's going. I said to him, you do understand that I wrote 105,000 <laughs> words on persuasion. And uh, I understand where this is going to go. And this is not why I wrote the book. I, I, I didn't write the book to become a social media influencer, right? I'm a writer. This is what I do. And it was just interesting to me that he had come with this sort of very basic, you know, maybe in other cases, like maybe I'm sure it works just fine. But with, with, for me, it was like, okay, it's, there's 20% this, 30% that, here's the other piece, right? So I said, let's let's just move on because I already figured out the chemistry. <laughs> thank you, but no thank you. This is not, I'm not that kind of person. That's not my interest. So yeah, you, and it's, and it's fun because once you see it and then you look at movies, right? Television, um, it can be funny to go back and look at things having read the book and go, oh, this is exactly what's going on. Like I joke about the start, there's a Star Wars five where Darth Vader is trying to persuade Luke Skywalker to join, you know, the famous scene, the I am your father scene. And I I show people the scene and I say, he, he tries three things. The first one is emotional. He says, think of the power, Luke, join me and you'll be the second most powerful person, right? In the galaxy, you're gonna rule at my size. Isn't that, doesn't that feel good, that idea of being so powerful? That doesn't work. But then Vader says, look, war is awful. <laughs> no, there's so much chaos, so much violence. If you join me, we're going to have peace. Don't you want to bring peace? And he has this very logical argument about how terrible war is and that by joining him, he's going to restore peace. There's argument. That doesn't work. But then what does he say? I'm your father. <laughs> I'm your father. Right? We're the same person. Character slash origin, right? <laughs> the trump card. And so it's like, oh my God. It's like even Vader follows the rules. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the funny part is that joke that we, we never know that he would have persuaded Luke because Luke falls off that gantry or whatever it is, right? So he wasn't there long enough to be persuaded. But even in that scene, when I show everybody laughs, because I say it's it's there it is, right there. There, there are the there are the three modes. He tries one at a time and none of them work. But uh, once you see it, I, maybe you can't. At least I cannot see it. <laughs> I, I, see, I see the chemistry in all these of all these movie scenes that are funny for me to watch. Yeah, I bet that's the case. Once again, it's an awareness that once you see it, you just can't turn it back off. I, I can imagine that that's the case. That's super, that's super cool. So, is there? Do you have an example, even for like a personal example, of some things or some ways that you've been able to take this information and this knowledge and turn them into helping persuade? whether it's your audience, right? You're trying to obviously help other leaders, other, other coaches, other, um, even, you know, whatever form format of, of work that they're doing. Do you have any other, you know, like examples of how you've taken what you've learned 
and used it to, you know, help persuade the people that are under your influence. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story from when I was when I was working as a consultant, and uh, I had a young man who who was a, a brilliant. I was working in Germany with a German team, um, brilliant engineer, just fantastic. And so we were on a complicated project, and we were finishing up the first phase of the project, and we, we had about two weeks left to go. And he came to me and he said, I'm, "I finished all my work for this phase. Can I start the next phase?" And I said, "Sure, go right ahead." Not long after was promotion season, and he thought he was sure he was going to get promoted. And he, he heard that he was not getting promoted and that I had stopped the promotion. <laughs> so he came to me and said, what the, you know, are you kidding me? I'm the best person on the team. And you're stopping the promotion? Why? And I said, because when you were two weeks ahead, when you were done and there were two weeks left, you came and asked me, how do you get farther ahead of everybody else? What you should have asked was, who's struggling? Who needs help? So uh, how can I help them catch up so that we all make it across right, the finish line together? I said, you didn't. You didn't even think about anybody else. You thought only about yourself. I said, that's not the character of a leader. The leader puts everybody else first. And he didn't do that. So show me that and it's we're finished, right? Because you have every other trait. And I explained to him in that case right, that it was, he, he didn't persuade me to promote him because he didn't show me the character trait right, of, of knowing that he was responsible for the team, not just for himself. So, uh, and, and I've had it, you know, reversed to me. I, I worked with the team in Spain for mul multiple years and this was a lesson for me. And I, I had gone to Spain and I was very sort of American in my American style. Uh, I was very sort of a player centric, you know, full confession. And we did one of these 180 feedback things, right? And the team came back and said, we don't like working for you because all you care about is A players. And those of us who don't think of ourselves that way don't really feel that you are that interested in us. And boy, I tell you, it hit me like a brick to the head. And I realized you're right, you're right. And I also realized at that point that, you know what? It's easy to manage A players. Anybody can do that. What's harder is to make them. And I decided that from that day on, my job wasn't to manage A players, it was to create them as best as I could. And it changed everything. I, 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 became, I became devoted to the idea of how do I help you find the thing? I used to call it Wizard of Oz management. <laughs> I was like, you've got it. You just don't know you have it. So how do I help you? get that. And there was a, a young woman who, who, who came to work for me and people told me, don't put her on your team. Don't hire her. She's indecisive. This was, this was the knock on her. Right. And I wasn't persuaded that she was indecisive. When I got to know her, what I realized is she had to work with people who that whenever they made, she made a mistake, they would jump down her throat and criticize her. So guess what happens if people yell at scream at you if you make a mistake, you don't want to make decisions. Once she understood that if there was a mistake, it's not the end of the world. We work through it. It's okay. Suddenly she became the most decisive person on the team because she wasn't afraid to make a choice anymore. So it, it was, it was that feedback of looking at your character and how you're behaving, right? Your style, the language you use, what you value is leaving people out. So you need to change. And I did happy to say it was a hard lesson to take, but it was, the team persuaded me, right, that the way I was managing was was wrong. And so, and I see it all the time, even now as I coach people that um, so often they just haven't thought about how these mechanisms work. You know, and to be fair, like, why should they, right? This, like, this isn't in school. I, I have this talk that I do about the book and early on, there's a slide of, of a person, there's a blurry image of a person playing the piano in front of an audience. And I show this slide and I say, imagine you were trying to make partner or trying to get a big promotion. And you go through all these interviews, all these selection committees, and you're told you're dead great. Okay. You've got the job. There's only one thing left. Just go on stage and play the piano. Doesn't matter what you pick, Bach, Mozart, little Beethoven. It's, you, we don't care. Just 
knock it out, right? A, few, a couple dozen bars and, you, and you're, you're good. You go, wait a minute, I've never had piano lessons. I, I've never even been in front of a piano. And they say, well, guess what? I don't know, all our leaders seem to play the piano. So if you want to be a leader, you better play. It's a silly story until I replace piano with persuade. Hmm. How is it any different? So somehow we're supposed to know all this. Right? No, it's it's it is it is a a technique that can be learned, uh, and it's not our fault that we don't know it. But hopefully, the book gives you something, a place to start, and a way to change that, and to walk away from the book saying, "Okay, I know what this is. I know what I'm hearing. I know what I'm seeing. And I know how to do it." I, hopefully, for me, the best thing is that you read your book and you feel I can teach somebody else, because that would be the best thing taking it and applying it obviously in your own life, but then obviously giving it to others. That's so, so super powerful. Right. That's super mm-hmm. cool. Love that. Mm-hmm. So you shared a ton of wisdom there and that little snippet. And I love that. And a big passion of mine is to try to help that younger generation that is on the way up, right? Maybe they don't have all the experiences. Maybe you mentioned about going through different interview processes and those types of things, whatever goal they're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. I'm going to prod you a little bit more. Can you think of any more, uh, pieces within that persuasion piece of, of importance when it comes to they're in an environment, maybe it's an unknown environment. Maybe they're in the first role of helping, like you said, mm-hmm. instead of thinking of themselves at the first, this is like their first time that they've had to, they've got to think for others as a parent, right? I instantly do that for my, me and my family. Right. But at the same time, if you haven't experienced that, you might not necessarily even know where to begin. Mm-hmm. Persuasion is a big piece of that. I share with my kids. My kids are in their 20s. And I and my dad shared this with me a long time ago when I was in that 20, 30-year-old range as well. It'll be difficult to get respect from people with more experience. And the way to do that is through persuasion. I mean, he didn't say it in that way, but in a way, that's kind of what he was trying to tell me back in the day. So anyways, I want to just kind of turn that over to you. Is there anything else within the world of persuasion that you can think of that would be very important and powerful to a young individual that is trying to make it out there in the world today? Yeah, I'd say go back to a, an actual story, right? Where I, I used to lead the recruiting team at the Ivy League school and the undergraduate recruiting team. So I would go every year and we would recruit. And I remember going to to one of the one of the top two or three right Ivy League schools, and there was a resume I got, my first resume of the day, and the, the first bullet point on the resume was dishwasher, cafeteria, right? Dishwasher, and then it said like line manager, and then like a term, you know, finally assistant manager at this cafeteria. But the first the first word of the first bullet in this Ivy League resume was dishwasher. So she walks in. And I said, I got to ask you, you know, the first word of the first line of the first bullet is dishwasher. Why dishwasher? And she said, this is a fancy place, a lot of rich kids. And a lot of people are here because their parents are funding, you know, the cruise. I'm not one of those kids. I had to work. I started at washing dishes and then I became a line manager and I went to business as assistant manager to one of the student assistant manager at one of the cafeterias. She said, I, I've worked for this, right? I've earned this. And the way she said it, which such, such honesty and such composure, such like groundedness of who she was, all I could think of was you get the first offer. End of story. Like everybody else is now fighting for the other spots because you, and she did, and she got the first offer and she went on to become a very successful executive. And the remarkable presence of mind, not to hide something, right? But to present it and then persuade me that this thing, which for any other kid would have been something to never talk about, was the reason I should hire her, was a remarkable story to me, right? I, to, like I said, I just told the story. This is whatever it was 25 years ago, and I never forgot her. And this is just a good example of first job interview right out of college, and she nailed it. She understood this innately, the power of character. That's what I was about to ask you. So it was more of an innate thing. Do you, do you think that she had any type of help to even think through that kind of a process? Or you just think that that was just a feeling she had that it was important to her. So she wanted to make sure it was important to you. 
I think it was that. I think it was important to her. Right? I think she just knew. And, and there are communicators, most communicators don't study this, right? Today, persuasion is, is a kind of part of rhetoric, which is, a, which is an academic discipline uh, and has many other things that are included in this besides this. But the average person, they don't take persuasion classes in high school or in college or MBA school. So if they're good at it, they just innately know this. And in, in her case, it was there. Like anything else, right? There are people who, who play the piano who never take lessons and just somehow you know, jealous of them because they just somehow have that talent. But most people can learn how to do it, how to do it better if you get a teacher or if you read a book about something. So I think if you're just starting out, understand that, that if you've heard this is some kind of soft skill, forget that. It's serious. It's a technique. It has the rules that you can learn and get better. And the sooner you start, the better you'll be, right? Because if I'm coaching somebody and I got to undo years of being told you're not part of the story, that's a problem. If you know from the beginning, and, and in some way, the young people are part of the story because they grew up on social media. Maybe it's a little bit too much because social media values character in many cases, right? It's like YouTube, for example, is a character driven social media platform. And so they have the other problem, which they, they sometimes, the, the, if, you're, if I were a coach, I'm not coaching people who are 22, 23, typically. If I were, I would probably have to undo that, that sale right? Maybe the one that's that's tatter and the argument and the other ones. And also social media values emotion, actually sentimentality versus emotion. It's very sentimental social media. And so uh, I think they, people who are very young and on, on social media have been over sentimentalized for the most part, right? Um, which is, which can be very bad. In fact, it's one of the things that I talk about in chapter nine, which is sentimentality. Uh, Klemperer says the Nazis were very sentimental <laughs> and uh, he he's afraid of sentimentality. It's a warning sign to him. And I agree. I think the sentimentalization of social media is a real problem. So uh, they the people who grew up on social media have a different set of issues than a 40-something-year-old right um, senior executive in, in the corporate world because their, in, their persuasion and environment the chemistry has changed because of social media. So how, as an adult, and obviously you're a father, right? As am I. So if we're hearing that something like that, as far as the sentimentalization, is that, did I say that right? I yeah, apologize right. if I did not. Okay. Uh, if that's an issue, what is the solution? I, I would assume that learning, becoming aware that this persuasion piece is, is key, right? Is that, that really the, the, main way that we as adults, whether we're parents or whether we're leading younger children, can bring this, shine this light, how important this persuasion piece is. I assume is that mostly the most important part? Yeah, and, and twofold. First of all, on the emotional side, right, and sentiment side is that, say, listen, they, you, you, this, this is, a, this is a, a, often a very weak attempt to persuade you and don't be persuaded by it because it's just sentimentality. And likewise on character, you know, they have this term FOMO, right? And if you talk to, and I interviewed some, some younger people for the book, and one of the things they complain about is everybody's life looks great except mine because nobody puts a terrible day on Instagram, right? And, and so I said, but you understand these are fake characters that are being built. There's, no, there's nothing real about this. It's a fabrication, right? Most, in, well, I don't say most, I say so much of being an influencer is the fabrication of a character in order to sell something. You are being marketed to, you're being sold to. Right? And, if in, and if in many years ago, what happened was that some sports star or whatever, or somebody put on a white coat and went on a commercial, right? And used the fake character of a doctor <laughs> to convince you to buy some cream. It's the same thing. It's just happening on social media. The person who's telling you, look at my life, I'm at the spa and I'm eating this and drinking that. Isn't this great? Why don't you go try out this cream? It's the same thing. They were selling you a cream with a guy in a white lab coat. Now they're sending you a cream with a woman, uh, you know, at the at, uh, at some fancy four, at the Four Seasons. What's the difference? So look beyond this. It is just the same old thing. Just the formula has been repackaged, but it is the formula that's there and learn to see it. And they will, right? It's a funny thing. Once they see it, they go, oh, okay, I get it. And... Uh, it is not that sophisticated, right? What's happening in these places. It, it's it, The problem is that it's happening at so much scale. It isn't that the, the people's social media are such good at persuasion. They're not. 
but they're but you're being bombarded by it so much and there's so much volume right and the doom scrolling and and spent wasting two hours swipe 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 it has its effect it does and so that's the issue it's it's a lot of very bad chemistry right it's Hence, really what it is right, right back right. to the book right it's all bad yeah. chemistry as you mentioned at the beginning chemistry can either enhance your life or it can kill your life or take your life which is yeah and it can literally kill you when in the case of people who have committed suicide true right because they were persuaded that they were not good or they were convinced that they were not worthy of living for whatever reason that is that is another example of people who persuaded someone that they did not merit life hmm. right and it's horrendous that, that, that those are extreme examples but but they're out there and so uh yeah, I think that when we help our kids understand what you're seeing isn't real. It's just, it's, it's, it's fakery, right? And this is how the, it's how the fakery works. It's the, it's the, it's like, it's not a magic trick. You know, the sleeve, the car was up to sleeve. It's high. Suddenly it loses its power, right? And that's, and that's hopefully, when I've spoken to student groups, what I try to explain to them is this is something that's endemic. And your gener- we had a different version of the problem, right? Because we were given other things. For example, it used to be that authorities carried a tremendous amount of weight in this country. So corrupt persuasion was often done through, the, through an authority figure, right? And that's not so much the case anymore. It's done in different ways. And so um, it, the persuasion strategies sort of shift. They're still operating with the same things, but the mechanisms are different. And so you, you, you would just kind of, you know how they'd say they mix, they change the vaccine because <laughs> the thing it keeps mutating. Well, the same thing happens here, right? It's still using the same things, but I'm going to change it a little bit because now you're being exposed to endless messages. And we have a, you know, the election is right now. So this is like a joke. It's a Super Bowl of persuasion happens in America every four years. And it's, we're, you know, we're in the first quarter and you, it's the same thing again, right? There's going to be a movie that shows the candidate as a kid and where they grew up, that's going to happen. There will be people who tell you what a great person he is, right? Or she is. And there will be claims about the future, right? Uh, claims about an opponent. And so the the political formulas are, are really the most predictable. Right? And so, but it's still fun to watch how, how they execute. And when somebody... Because so, here and there, somebody is clever. And you go, okay, ooh, that was nice. <laughs> that's that's I like that use. Mm-hmm. But that's what comes along with your skill set, right? That comes along with all the study and all the things that you've done. And and so it's fascinating to me that when you become aware, similar, I'm, I'm not going to proclaim that I'm as aware of it as you are. I do pay attention. I try to see what's, the question I always ask is, what are they trying to sell me? And it doesn't have to be like a physical money exchange. It's like an idea. Like, what are, what are they trying to persuade me to think or believe? Those are the thoughts that go through my mind. And you were talking about commercials and things. A lot of times you'll see the uh, the commercial for whatever it is, but then you get the, the very small print at the very end of the ad that you can't see. Even if you zoomed in, you couldn't see it and read it, right? But it's like the the government or the communicate, uh, FCC is like made it where that's mandatory, Right. Yeah. But it's not on social media. I'm curious. That, yeah. It'd be interesting if they ever make that a mandatory thing. It's like you were saying, it's all a made up facade. Right. I've met plenty of people that on the out on their front of stage shows off and, you know, they make it appear that they're X, Y, Z. But then when you start to dig into their real life, it's nowhere, it's nowhere near, which is always a fascinating thing when I always try to take a look at that for sure. Yeah. And, and, and there is that right of that theater, uh, and like, like like LinkedIn is a good example, right? LinkedIn, which I, I study LinkedIn, and uh, and it's fascinating because it, it is the worst collection of content on the planet, right? Of like the worst was, collection of content. The worst collection of sort of bad, it, it, it's like a museum of bad persuasion. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> See, now I'm going to look at it in a different way. That's that's interesting. What do you mean you by know, that? I'm curious. Well, okay, you, somebody posts. I'm so excited that I am with customer X as they launch, I don't know, software product Y. And you go, no, you're not. You're not, you don't even look excited, right? You're, you're not excited. You're, you post this because it's your customer and you're trying to score some points with the customer, 
by by doing a shout out because they you went to some product launch. You don't mean any of this. It doesn't mean anything what you're saying, right? And so most of LinkedIn content, the feeds, it's meaningless. And that's a, on a good day. On a bad day, it is horrible persuasion. It isn't even like corrupt because I won't even give that credit. It's just, it's just pointless. What are you, what are you trying to, why are you saying this? I wish I could just turn it all off, right? And say, say one thing that actually means something. I, I, we're so excited that we completed or that somebody has been here for 20 years. So what's the point? <laughs> I mean, so they don't want to quit. <laughs> that's an achievement like, and if it is good for them celebrate it perfectly it means nothing to us that that for whatever reason either they, they didn't want to or they couldn't or whatever that they, somehow they spent two decades there it may be a very meaningful thing to you in private but to the outside world it's meaningless and what are you trying to say that people can't leave your job i mean what do you what is the thing that you want me to believe right and it's so lazy because it's post after post after post when you go, you didn't even think for one second about what this is about. Not even for one second. You just grab the press release or grab whatever and throw it out there. The, the only thing I ever post on LinkedIn is that I try once a day to find a really great read, right? A really, I mean, hopefully a really interesting, like I read, there was an article about women who work in the South Pole, but I, that was the last thing I shared. Really interesting at least to me. So if I can find one thing that is a really fascinating read, right? Uh, generally about business-ish maybe, but just an interesting read, just a great story. I share that. I don't share anything else. Maybe uh, I'll, sh I'll share that I'm on a podcast because people like to know. But as far as like, I, I don't put, hey, I, I just finished whatever, you know, I, I don't. It's, doesn't nobody cares, <laughs> right? Read this story. It's a great story. If I share a story on LinkedIn, it's usually a really good story. Uh, but that's it. All the other stuff, it's funny to watch. To me. As a student of the student of this stuff, right? Like I said, it's a museum of bad persuasion. That's what I'm going to call LinkedIn from now on. <laughs> a museum of bad persuasion, and I'm not going to let that go either. That is that's interesting. I've I try not to consume a ton of social media and LinkedIn is part of that. But at the same time, I'm never going to look at that the same way. I guarantee you all, all because of you, Carlos. I appreciate that. In fact, I'm going to start collecting them. I'm going to start the museum. <laughs> you should. You should. You, you should copy paste or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever the best way to collect your examples of not good persuasion. Yeah, because of what I see, it's like, wait, if you had just changed this one little thing, like it would have at least accomplish something right and it's uh it's to, instead of just taking up digital real estate but anyway that's that's a whole nother matter <laughs> the, the thing for me is to your original question the sooner you start to think about this stuff the sooner you start to become a critic and to perceive it the more innate it becomes if you're if anybody who learned how to play a musical instrument you know that when the first time you do scales it feels like an unnatural act at least in the piano which is what i know your hand has two strange things seems odd and you think i'll never do this a few years later you're, you can you can eat a sandwich while you do scales it's become innate right and so i think the same thing happens here it seems a little odd at first because it's it's structured in a way that you're used to free flowing right imagine you, your whole life you ate without knife and fork and then somebody goes here's a knife and fork and you go, oh this is really weird <laughs> what's this thing you know oh no i i'd rather just keep eating without the knife and fork or no Here's a knife and fork. It's very handy <laughs> for the first for the first few days. A knife and fork might be a little bit odd. Then you go, okay, I see why. And I think the same thing is kind of here. It may seem a little odd at first, but hopefully, once you start to use it, you go, oh, wait a minute, that's it. That's all I had to do. Great. Mm -hmm. And start there. Start with the basics, start, yeah. right. which starts with your book, The Rules of Persuasion which is where I'm so excited that you came on here and had this discussion today. I am a big advocate and what I talk about a lot within my podcast and my message is taking control, having control of what's going on in your environment with your money, your mind and persuasion, being persuaded by an outside influence is 100% a piece of that. And that's why I was so excited to have you on to go a little deeper and learn more about persuasion. It's like you're teaching me, obviously, and then obviously you're bringing a ton of value for the listeners out there as well. 
So take a couple minutes as we begin to bring this one in for a landing and tell everybody a little bit more. It's like they're they're get maybe they this is a term or a thought or an idea that it's brand new. They're they're like becoming aware that this is a thing. Where is it that they can learn more about you, about your book, and connect with you out there in the yeah, uh, in the social world in, of the world out there? Yeah, I'll start with me, which is I, I do have a website. I'm not completely <laughs> like not findable. So it's carlosalvarenga.com, which has information about other publishing projects and future past, present, and future. Uh, so if you want to know more about my writing, you can find that there. I also write a newsletter on Substack, which is about culture. So I critique art, music, a lot of different things, books. So you can find it there. And also you can send me a note. You can, I, I like to read, hear people who read the book. And so if you want to send me a note or contact me, you can contact me through the website, carlosalbringit.com. Of course, the book is on Amazon, so it's available uh, physical form. It's on Audible. It's on Kindle. It's on audiobooks.com. I did the narration, which was a nightmare. Uh, so <laughs> that's a whole other story. We won't have time for that, but I'm curious of how that went. Let's just say it's five days in a recording booth and I lost my voice. So mm. I it was a lot of effort to make the narration for the book. So if you hear it, if you like to listen to books, you can, you're welcome to hear it. So yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 countries. So hopefully even if you're overseas, you can hear it as well or buy it. So yeah, it's easy to find. Right? So Substack, you mentioned that as far as a place for people to reach you. Is that, do they just search for your name or what's the best place? Yeah, I'm, if you I go to so. Substack, yeah. you, you can search on my name because that'll appear that way as the, because I write it or it's, and it's called Critic at Large. If you put Critic at Large, you'll find it. But it's also linked from my website. So if you forget, just go to carlsbring.com. There's a newsletter link and it'll take you right to the Substack, and you can sign up there mm-hmm. and it's Fantastic. free there's nothing you have to pay for mm-hmm. nothing wrong with free but at the Absolutely. same time folks you need to go out there and get the book the rules of persuasion that is as i mentioned i knew this conversation was going to be a ton of fun i'm 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 a studier of life of different environments persuasion is part of that i'm self-taught, I would say. I read, he, he mentioned, or Carlos mentioned about different books out there about persuasion and and that type of thing. And I've probably read this exact same books. Each one is a little bit different. Carlos comes with a little bit of a spin. I love how his analogy of talking about it being chemistry and you take different parts of that chemistry to create your your message to persuade and help people out there in your communities and in your, in your leadership organizations and your companies it's super cool, which is exactly why I was super excited to have Carlos here on the show. So Carlos, appreciate it, man. I appreciate you coming on and sharing so much wisdom with us here. On the I'm, always grateful. I'm extremely grateful to anyone who gives me a little bit of time to talk about my book and my work and to everyone who's listening and thank you for you as well. So it's been a pleasure. I'll be happy to come back anytime. Fantastic. So folks go out there, folks will be in great. Take control. Realize that the message that messages that you're being fed, whether it be through social media, whether it be through television, radio, wherever you're getting and collecting information, it may not be in your best interest. And to be able to take control of those ideas by learning about this persuasion piece is going to be crucial for you to be able to take take action, take control, and really start crafting the life that you desire versus it being and the benefit of somebody else, which, you know, we don't always want that to happen for sure. So go out there, as I mentioned, focus on being great. And I look forward to bringing back the next guest again with you very soon. Until then, bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.